Hi guys, this is going to be the first video in a new series that I'm calling Pantheist Reads. I decided that in order to start branching out a little bit on the channel, I decided to start talking about books more on the channel, to start doing some book reviews and just having some book discussions and that sort of thing. And just before I start, I will say that I chose to use Pantheist Reads rather than Pagan Reads because I feel like all of this is informed by the Pantheistic element of my spirituality rather than the pagan element. The pagan element for me is more practice oriented, it's more about the sort of bells and whistles I suppose of my ritual as opposed to kind of my core beliefs and my core beliefs about the universe and that spills over much more readily as I'm sure you can imagine into how I see life more generally and some of the things that I think are most important for us to think and talk about. But the first book I want to talk about in this series is fairly pagan relevant, and that is Feral by George Monbiot. So George Monbiot is a, a writer who has a column in The Guardian, and some of you may know him uh, from there. Uh, certainly I had kind of come across him on occasion before for that reason. And he uh, certainly used to live in Wales, he's from Wales, and large portions of this book are set in Wales and use kind of the Welsh landscape. There are kind of descriptive sections describing uh, the Welsh nature and uh, the landscape of Wales, of parts of Wales, and that kind of plays a role in his discussions in this book. So the topic of the book is essentially rewilding. And this rewilding is kind of quite a, quite a broad term, which can kind of mean quite a lot of different things. But essentially the idea with rewilding is that you section off a portion of land, which may be publicly owned, privately owned, or however, and allow it to sort of revert to its more natural state, basically without any human intervention. But rewilding can also consist of reintroducing wild animals, wild species that are native to the area, or animals that are maybe not native to the area, but are very similar to now extinct animals which used to be native to the area. And it also, I suppose, might involve, and I think this is something he does discuss in the book as well, it also may, inv may involve introducing um, plant life back to an area that has, again, maybe become extinct and reintroducing similar plants back in or, or what have you. So the idea is that you're kind of letting, letting the area rewild by itself without human intervention, apart from maybe that one decision to kind of reintroduce one certain species that has been removed from the area by farming or human intervention. I'm pretty sure that I was introduced to this book by John Halstead of The Allergic Pagan uh, and I'll link his blog below if you're interested in going and checking him out. If you aren't actually familiar with his blog, he writes some really interesting stuff on pantheistic naturalistic paganism. And he has kind of in the last couple of years become more interested in kind of eco-paganism, environmentalism. And I think it's interesting that it was he who actually alerted me to this book because it is very much based uh, in the UK, on the UK. And um, he does kind of explore and discuss the uses of land and rewilding projects in other parts of the world, but for the most part he's concerned with Europe and specifically with the UK, with a fair amount of mention of Ireland as well. So, uh, but I think it's interesting that George Halstead did actually find this book obviously to be very inspiring and very interesting. So even if you are in the United States, which is where John Halstead is from, uh, or just outside of, of Europe or the, the UK or Ireland, um, you will probably still get a lot out of this book. That being said, I actually really enjoyed that it was written by a British author and focused uh, primarily on the, the situation in the UK and rewilding projects in Europe, because a lot of the time I do end up reading things that are, are kind of focused on the United States and policies in the United States. And it, then it kind of, I don't learn a lot about the policies where I actually live and where I'm from. And obviously I'm living in the UK and even over in Ireland, the, the, the landscape is kind of geographically and even politically quite similar to the UK. Um, certainly in terms of the kind of rewilding issues that we, you know, we face, we will, we will face or we are facing in the UK um, would be very, very similar in Ireland. So I'm not going to try and give you a synopsis of the book or anything because I'm sure you can find that fairly easily for yourselves online by having a quick Google search for this book. But I just kind of want to 
break down some of the, the main concepts or some of the ideas that popped into my head while reading it and just discuss it from my perspective as a spiritual person, as a pantheist, as an environmentalist. So Monbiot is primarily concerned throughout this book with encouraging and uh, improving ecological diversity. That's kind of the standpoint that he's coming from. So while you can definitely see it as being an environmentalist book, he's not particularly concerned with questions of climate change and so on, although that is definitely mentioned throughout the book and a lot of his arguments for rewilding do of course hinge on the question of climate change, of global warming, and how uh, an, an increase in the amount of trees and you know would decrease levels of carbon in the atmosphere and so on. But primarily he's kind of coming from that, that position of eco ecological diversity is good. Um, and I think that it, there are kind of maybe weaknesses and strengths associated with that. I came away from it feeling a little bit like uh, maybe I would have liked to see the argument tied in a little bit more with the kind of argument for the change we need to make in order to uh, stem climate change. Um, but then on the other hand, maybe it is good to just to have one kind of compact uh, argument, which is essentially what this book is, for the concept of rewilding itself. Um, he goes into quite a lot of detail about uh, different types of rewilding projects and his his reasoning for why these pro this is kind of an important thing for us to be doing. Um, and just he describes in a great wealth of detail uh, the impact that the reintroduction of say one species, like say a predator, will have on the environment. And primarily I would say his main argument throughout this book is he kind of focuses on farming. Uh, particularly sheep farming and sheep grazing and the hugely detrimental impact that this has on ecological uh, diversity. And this isn't really something that I had actually really thought about a lot. It definitely occurred to me um, on my trips to Kerry when I've been spending more, more and more time in, in rural west, the rural west coast of Ireland, it definitely was occurring to me more and more that while when I first went down there I was thinking of this as being kind of wilderness, that I was getting out into the wild, into the wilds of nature, but it did kind of gradually occur to me more and more just to what extent that land is entirely farmed. And it's not even just the areas of the land that where you can actually visibly see fields in which there are sheep and cows being grazed, but just large swathes of landscape where um, sheep are kind of allowed to roam free. There's quite a lot of commonage, kind of common land and things like that that people are allowed to graze their sheep on. And in fact, I would, I would say that probably on the entire peninsula, apart from a couple of people's back gardens, there, there's really nothing in, in the way of land being cordoned off from the impact of sheep and from sheep grazing, because it's just kind of a really ingrained part of uh, the British and Irish landscape. It's, we've been farming sheep and you know farming in general on this land for uh, many thousands of years, and it's kind of become almost completely accepted that any natural or uh, even wild part of, of the country would be allowed to have sheep in it. And uh, his argument against sheep is probably just one of the most interesting aspects of this book that I came across because it's such a simple argument. He demonstrates really cogently just how unuseful, unhelpful, uneconomically viable the sheep uh, farming industry is in Britain and Ireland and how all the same we are kind of throwing money at the situation because it's seen as being a cultural heritage that we have to maintain, but that actually there are much better uses that we could be using the land for. So politically and economically, I found this book very, very persuasive from that perspective. It really got me thinking about how uh, we aren't really putting pressure, or certainly I am not helping to put any pressure on our governments to make changes in places like that where it would actually be quite um, easy to make changes. It'd be quite easy uh, to set up a structure by which um, that farmlands that are actually not um, making their farmers enough money to live off or that aren't you know economically viable um, that they're not producing anything that is actually needed by our societies that that land should therefore uh, be rewilded allowed to revert and that some sort of economic structure could be put in place um, to uh, help that happen and then that land can uh, generate revenue by other means I found that very very uh, convincing and really interesting it was really something that opened my eyes up to um, just a different way by which we can encourage our governments to um, 
uh, to introduce greener policies uh, because at the end of the day farming as we are probably becoming uh, increasingly aware is not a green activity um, it's, it's causing huge problems for the environment and when we think about the environmental crisis we think a lot about factories and we think a lot about industry we don't really think so much about farming and it's just one of those areas where there's kind of no need for it anyway I found that very interesting but it also really did get me thinking a lot as well about um, the lack of wilderness that we have in Britain and Ireland and how we think of these farmlands as being sort of the, the untouched parts of Ireland and that they're sort of wild and unkempt and in their natural state when actually they're not and even the sections that aren't being heavily farmed have still been um, basically reduced to um, a really barren version of their former selves and their potential selves. Uh, he talks about the fear that we seem to have in Europe in general but more particularly in Britain and Ireland um, of wilderness of wild animals, of actually allowing our land to revert, of stopping our interference with that land. And he talks a lot about how we have this notion that um, even in order to, to bring more ecologic di ecological diversity and to improve the health of our planet, that that requires our intervention and our active, uh, our active interference. But at the end of the day, <laughs> Uh, a lot of the time what really needs to be done is for us to sit back and do nothing and actually just let things heal themselves and just leave them alone and try and maybe remove the elements that we have brought in that have really changed the ecosystem. I found those discussions really interesting that were kind of showing how we have this aversion to uh, allowing things to slip from our control. Um, even when it, when it is coming from a more kind of environmental kind of... Uh, perspective but just quite generally in our society that we have this sort of ingrained fear of wilderness that kind of isn't really being addressed and that we don't always acknowledge. I think a desire for true wilderness, true wildness is something that uh, many pantheists and particularly many pagans are really familiar with. I think it's it's one of the things that actually really draws us into paganism or that makes us think about pantheism in the first place, that makes us uh, feel like uh, the divine or the numinous is attached to the worldly, um, that it is the worldly, the nature, what we actually experience in our bodies, that the universe and our earth and our ecosystem is actually what is divine. It, there's a very natural connection there uh, with wanting to encourage and allow parts of that world to revert to wilderness. Um, just kind of as much as and this definitely comes into his argument as well, um, not just so that the planet and the ecosystem can uh, survive and thrive and uh, kind of revert to their natural state, not just for the sake of sort of a vague concept of the planet or the ecosystem, but for our own benefit as well. And he talks a little bit about the psychology behind that and how psychologically we um, we are we would benefit from having increased wilderness or wildness in our lives and that it is actually um, despite the fact that we are so afraid of it apparently in our societies it's something that uh, we are missing that we are lacking and that we would hugely benefit by having a little bit kind of in reintegrated back um, into our lives. And that's something that really resonates with me and that will probably resonate with a lot of you as well um, for those reasons that, that I've kind of stated. Because at the end of the day, when we're talking about environmentalism more generally, it is kind of a, a selfish project. We are trying to maintain a world that can sustain human beings. And you know, even if we're doing that for our descendants and for other people in the world who will suffer the most uh, when climate change uh, causes huge uh, disasters and huge problems for us worldwide, um, even if we're not doing it specifically for our immediate selves, um, it still is on a species wide level, um, a fairly selfish desire. Uh, and that's, that's okay. I think, <laughs> I think it's okay for us to want to um, sustain our, our species and to build a world that is a nicer place for us to live in. Um, and obviously there is the added bonus that we are creating or sustaining an environment for the others, all the other species uh, to live in too. 
um, but that's not really something that he gets into a lot in this book. Um, it, that sort of that sort of argument that um, we have a kind of moral imperative to uh, to not drag everything else down with us isn't really something that he gets into. He focuses more just on the enjoyment that humans, we as humans, can get out of uh, a rewilding project, out of having more wilderness. As pagans, when we are designing rituals to celebrate the seasons of the year and to worship older gods, I think what we are trying to t tap into is an older version of our society that uh, was more in interaction with parts of nature that are not controlled, that was not within our control. I think a lot of the time that is kind of what we are trying to connect to. This uh, remembering that we're not in control of everything, uh, that there is this kind of wider, wider thing unfolding around us, that we are just kind of one tiny part of a, a much greater unfolding, amazing creative thing. So yeah, I think rewilding as an environmental agenda is most definitely something that is worth your thought if you're a pantheist or a pagan. Um, it's definitely worth thinking about and worth reading about. And I really do like that it aligns itself um, quite well with other, other environmental issues, even if that's kind of not argued to its full extent in this book. The connections are there, it's quite clear. And it's definitely going to, this book is kind of going to play uh, a role in a much wider kind of uh, learning that I want to do about um, environmentalism and what we can actually do from where we are now uh, in order to improve things and change things and take positive steps forward.